If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'd like to talk to you tonight about effective ministries. Effective ministries. And we have a worksheet back there if you wanted to get one or if you missed it. Number one, two kinds of Christians. According to our text, there's two kinds of Christians. Number two, two kinds of ministers. Two kinds of ministers. And number three, two kinds of rewards. Two kinds of rewards. You know, even after we accept Christ we, and, and are saved, there continues a, a battle of good and evil in our lives. Satan, the world, tempts us with sin and encourages us to go back to the way we were living before we met Christ. The Apostle Paul shared that feeling in Romans chapter 7. You know, and basically, in short, he's saying, you know, those things that I need to be doing, I'm not doing. Those things that I don't need to be doing, I'm doing. And so there's this constant battle going on inside of us. Living the true Christian life will never be easy, but thank God he has given us the Holy Spirit who helps us in our daily living. Our flesh still wants to sin, but our spirit tells us to do the right thing every time. Everyone is called to be a minister and to have a ministry. The Apostle Paul shares uh, the keys to true ministry in our text. Let's look at these three things we need to know about effective ministry. I still believe if every church member would serve in some ministry of the church, we would never have a shortage of workers in any of our ministry. So effective ministries, two kinds of Christians. 1 Corinthians 3, 1, and I, brethren, could not speak to you, uh, uh, at, at, speak to you as as to you spiritual people, but as to carnals and babes in Christ. If I fed you with milk and not the solid food, for, for until now you were not able to receive it. Even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envies, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, says, I'm of Paul, and another says, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? And here he is talking about, I, you know, I, don't, I really don't think he's talking about new Christians, okay, because new Christians don't know any better yet. He's talking about Christians that have been Christians for a while, but still have not changed their ways. And so there are basically two kinds of Christians, and, and folks, they're in every church. Uh, they really are. They're, they're babes in Christ. And, uh, you know, truthfully, he's talking about spiritual maturity, all right? And it takes work to have spiritual maturity in your life. And so Paul was addressing this problem, and we know that the Corinthians church, I mean, it was, it was a challenging church. It was a carnal church. Okay, and uh, he several times had mentioned that, and here he is just getting to the jest of, you know, if if you are a Christian, you should grow in Christ. Uh, you know, you can look back in your life, and I would hope that two years ago, and you look at where you were two years ago uh, spiritually, I would hope that you could say about your life that you have grown in that way. And again, Carnal Christians are not necessarily babes in Christ or new believers, but they are people that have not grown in the faith. And I tell you, the biggest issue with growing folks is spending time in the Word of God. And here's what Satan does to us. He gets us so busy that we are so tied up and we are so tired when we get home from work or we're not an early riser and we don't want to do it early in the morning. And folks, you are not going to grow in Christian maturity apart from the Word of God. The other thing is prayer. And prayer is a discipline uh, that we need in our lives. And so, so there's two types of Christians here that he is talking about. Now, the mature Christian is what I would call a spirit-filled Christian. Now, that doesn't mean they're perfect. That doesn't mean they always do the right thing. But I am telling you, uh, they, they are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Uh, they look out for others. 
They look at ways that they can help others. And so Paul here is saying there's two types uh, you know, of, of Christians here. And, and what the church was doing and what many of the members were doing was saying, well, I'm of Paul, okay? And we know that Paul, uh, you know, in his own life, he was well-known, he was popular, well-traveled, he's a straight shooter, okay? And uh, Apollos, was, Apollos was more of a teacher. Uh, he had probably more of a gentle spirit. And folks, we should not uh, play favorites when it comes to even church work. And, and, you know, if somebody comes in, okay, let's just say a guest preacher comes in, and, and they are preaching the Word of God. And, you know, whether it's a revival or whether it's filling in, we should be able to get something out of that person because they're preaching the Word of God. And I know, uh, I've said this before, I'm not even my wife's favorite preacher. Charles Stanley is her favorite preacher. But I'm just saying that it doesn't mean she doesn't like my preaching. All right, it's what she grew up on. But here, these folks were just saying, well, if uh, Apollos is teaching or preaching, I'm not going to go. And folks, we shouldn't be that way. Uh, That's what immature Christians, that's what carnal Christians do. And so uh, we need to understand that part of our growth in our spiritual life is Christian maturity. And the Word of God is so important uh, a part of that life. Hold your finger there and go to Romans chapter 15. Romans 15. Romans 15, verse 1. We then who are strong ought to bear the scruples of the weak, not to please ourselves. And again, he's talking about strong Christians, mature Christians. And folks, we need to help the weak. Okay, we need to help those who are not spiritually mature, those that have not grown in the Lord, regardless of how long they've been a Christian, they need somebody to come along beside them and help them. And sometimes, uh, instead of helping people like that, you know, they could be a part of a conversation that we should have. You know, they're, they're spiritually immature. Well, I, I can't get down to their level. I can't do that. You know, and, and Paul here is just simply saying, we who are strong need to help those folks and come along beside them uh, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. And he's just talking about instead of going after somebody and, you know, like saying, hey, uh, you know, I, I, I was reading uh, 1 Corinthians 3, and you come under the category of a carnal Christian. And Brother Mike said Wednesday night, it's immaturity. And you need to, I mean, that's not the way to approach somebody. Folks, we need to be gentle with folks like that. We need to let them come along beside us. And it could start with just maybe coffee or something and just spending time with this person. Because, folks, part of our job as Christians is to mentor other Christians. We all, there was a time in our lives where we weren't spiritually mature where we didn't know what the Baptist faith and message was, or where we didn't realize we had not learned, you know, what the difference between a tithe and an offering is. And so he is simply saying, we who are strong, we need to identify those who are weak, and we need to come along beside them, not say in, in, in a way, I mean, you probably wouldn't say it, but you need to be like me. Well, folks, you don't need to be like me. You, we all need to be like Jesus. That's the fact there. Let each of us please his neighbor for the good of edification, for even Christ did not please himself, but it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. And if you look at Jesus' life, I mean, he dealt with the down and out. Okay, I mean, think of the woman at the well. I mean, he knew exactly what was going on in her life. He said, you know, go call your husband. He was getting right to the, the issue of what her problem was, okay? But he didn't talk down to her. And but matter of fact, I mean, uh, she uh, so changed Jesus, that, and meeting Jesus so changed her life that she was, you know, telling the whole town. She'd 
He just said, hey, y'all got to come hear this guy. All right? And do you realize that some of the new Christians are the best and most enthusiastic Christians there are? They hadn't got over being saved. And folks, truthfully, we should never get over being saved. We should always be excited about our walk with the Lord, and we should bring people with us. For whatever things were written before or were written for our learning, that through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And folks, I am telling you something Satan is using right now, strongly using. He wants people to think we're in a hopeless situation. Well, my Bible says with God, all things are possible. My Bible, and I believe with all my heart, that God can change anything and anyone. And so we need to look, literally look for people that come into our church and somebody that may have not come here long. Matter of fact, I was reading a card today, and it was a visitor that come. And the thing they put on the, the bottom is a very friendly church. And I, man, I, I mean, I'm like a proud daddy when I read that on a card. But it's more than just being friendly on a Sunday and being cordial to somebody. It's, hey, tell me your name. Hey, where, y'all, where did y'all come from? All right? And this is what Paul was trying to get them to understand. There are ways to be effective in our ministries. And the more lives that we touch, the more they're going to want to come here. And, and who knows? You know, you could start mentoring someone, and they could surrender to the ministry. Uh, they could go on the mission field. They could, because of your ministry, all right, you taking the time with that person, they could make a commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, may the God of patience and comfort grant to you to be like-minded towards one another, according to Jesus Christ, that you may be with one mind, one, one mind and one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice he says it here twice, patience and comfort. Folks, that's what we need to do when we mentor people. They may not come along at the speed that we think they should come along. They might not always do the right thing. But we need to be patient with new Christians and patient with Christians uh, that are carnal and bring them alongside us and, and, uh, and encourage them in the faith. And here's, here's the bottom line to this point, folks. Uh, discipling new Christians and discipling con- uh, uh, carnal Christians is an important ministry in any church. So we need to look for opportunities of, of ministry to where we can help mentor folks. So we have two kinds of Christians. We have two kinds of ministers. All right, look back in our text. It says, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. And again, today I went back to Alma and uh, I helped with the funeral and my boss, my senior pastor, was there, and he did the main thing. And then the regular pastor there uh, that's there now uh, uh, helped out too. And us three just tag-teamed uh, this funeral today. And I was sitting there thinking, uh, because I went first, and, and I had time to listen to all you know the other two, and I got to thinking about each gift each one of us has. And each one of us, we, we had a different presentation. We had a different emphasis. But God gives us these gifts. Okay, some people want to call it talent. There's a difference between a, ca- a talent and a gift. Okay, if you're a good singer, I mean, you could call that a talent. All right? But a gift comes from God. This is what he assigned you to do. All right? This is what, in, in mentoring folks, I believe and coming along beside people is, uh, is uh, a gift that he gives you. Now look at verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And folks, it doesn't matter who gets the credit. All right? We're not up here, you know, you know patting our spiritual selves and on the back. All right? Man, I'm just telling you, when somebody comes down the aisle and gets saved, I don't, I mean, somebody witnessed to them, 
Somebody, you know, led them to Christ, and I'm all for that. I think it's great. But folks, it is God that gives the increase. You know, and again, being, I, I think it had been about two years since I had been uh, back to Alma, and even then, you know, when I went today, you know, there were just people saying, man, I heard y'all are growing. And, and I would tell them, no, the Lord is growing our church. All right. And I've said this before, and I mean it, folks. We get, Steve and I and, and Cody, we get too much credit for what's going on around here. I understand I'm the lead pastor. I understand I'm the senior pastor. But we have to have this mentality that it is God that gives the increase. It is God that has given us the gifts that we have. And here's what, and, and I got to talking to a pastor, it was a week ago, and he said, does it bother you when people leave your church? And I said, in the first place, it's not my church. That's the first thing I said to him. And the second thing I said, no, it doesn't, okay? I don't take it personally. Why? Because if people are happy where they're at, they're not going to leave. But they get this idea, you know, that they, in, in, in pastors, and I'm just telling you, I've talked to many a pastor that is up at night wondering, why did they leave? Why? And folks, I'm just telling you, uh, you know, it is God that moves people around. It is God that gives us the gifts. And we should not follow man. We need to follow God. Look at verse 7. So then neither he who plants is anything, he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Why do you write the very same sentence down twice? For emphasis. You need those who will plant the seed. You need those that will water the seed. You need those who have the gift of reaping. Okay, there are just some folks in our church, I'm just telling you, Scott, that dude can turn any conversation into a salvation. I mean, he's amazing to walk, watch when we go on these mission trips. That is the gift that God has given us. But it takes us all. And do you realize that if you invite a neighbor or you invite someone to our church and they get saved, you were the one that was planting. You were the planter. They would, and I understand the sovereignty of God. I know they could get saved with or without our church or with or without you inviting them. But you were a part of that, folks. And that's what he is saying here. He said, he, he's saying that we as ministers, we need to be planting these seeds. And a lot of times, you know, there, there are people that, you know, they're, they're what I call results-oriented. They always want to see something happen. And folks, here's what I learned in the ministry. There's seasons in the ministries. Our first year in our sanctuary, we had 111 additions the first year. That, folks, I'm just telling you, that don't happen apart from a movement of God. But we haven't had 111 since then. Does that mean we're lazy? Does that mean, no. Does it mean God? No, folks. There are seasons. There are sometimes, you know, uh, you know the, the rain has fallen, the harvest is ripe, and God just opens the door. And here's what I found. You just need to thank God when he does those. Those are, those are just tremendous things. And again, it, it, the church I grew up in, uh, we had evangelism explosion. And we had J. Harold Smith in the spring. We had Bailey Smith in the fall. And every Tuesday night, there were 22 teams of three going out and knocking on doors in Lawton, Oklahoma. Their church, Cameron Baptist Church, was known for the ministry. That year, we had 356 people go through our baptismal water. Never seen anything like that in my life. And honestly, I've, I've not seen it since. All right? And that's what I'm saying. It's not a result-oriented thing. It's planting. Folks, you won't have a harvest if we don't plant seeds. We have to plant the seeds of the gospel. And everyone is important. It's just like when we go on mission trips, that person that's cooking in the kitchen not going out to the field, what are they doing? They're ministering to our people. And, and God, God sees that, and we need all kinds of people in the fields at God's at working for our Lord. 
And now, now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For, you, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Folks, everything we do is because of God. Every talent, everything that God does, is, it's God's thing. We need to make everything a God thing. According to the grace which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. And Paul in his ministry was very, very effective. Apollos was more of a teacher. It would almost be like Paul would come and he would start a church and it'd be new converts and he would stay with them a certain amount of time and he would find the leaders of that church. And then Apollos would like, with the gift of teaching and, and, and mentoring, he would come in by, behind them. Paul would move on and do his thing. He started church. After, you just look at his missionary journeys and that's what he was doing. But he would find people like Apollos and, and, and people that would come in uh, behind him and, and mentor people and disciple people. And I'm telling you, the ones who did that was just as important as Paul was. Acts chapter 15. Acts 15. I want you to see this. Acts 15, verse 36. Acts 15, 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's, go let's now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. And, and Paul did that, you know, occasionally. He would, he would go, you know, he, he would think, you know, we hadn't been there in two, three, four years. Let's just go, you know, take a reverse course of the way we got here and let's just go visit these churches and see how they're doing. And it says, now Barnabas was determined to take uh, with him John, Mark, John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take, uh, take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamph Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to do the work. Okay, now we have a problem. Okay, you have two spirit-filled men, you have two opinions, and you have two people that say the exact opposite. Barnabas, and you remember what his name was? What did his name mean? Encourager. Okay? Because there's always people like that. Okay? There's people that want to fire everybody. And there's people that want to uh, minister to those who get fired. Well, Paul was fired up, and uh, John Mark, and again, you know, I've heard all kinds of reasons of why he left, you know, that. Uh, he was the youngest, I've I heard everything, but he's the youngest child in his family till he was a mama's boy and, and all things. And, and folks, that doesn't matter. Okay, John left the, the, the mission field, and Paul was just thinking, man, I, I don't want to take somebody that walked away from the ministry. And folks, I, I hope you understand this. Uh, there, are people, there are men that walk away from the ministry every day. If you just take talking about worldwide ministries, in ministers, every day there are folks that quit. And I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering how many of those we could salvage if somebody took a special interest in that person. Because I, I, I thought about this a lot. I thought about if I wasn't doing what I'm doing, what would I do? Okay? I sold furniture right out of college and was pretty good at it, and that was because of my people skills. God has given me, I, I can meet somebody, and, you know, 20 minutes later, we're best friends. You know, it's just a gift that God gives me. The other gift that he has given me is the gift of remembering names. I still say, any given Sunday, 90% of the people in this sanctuary, I can tell you their first name. How do you do that? You, it's just God. It, God gives me that gift. If I hear it and they come at all, God just does that in my life. And that's what, that's what he's saying. It was two different kind of men, two different kind of ministries, but yet one was saying, man, he, he, you know, he quit. 
He's not worth taking. He's not worth salvaging. And folks, I am telling you, and I mean this with all my heart, everybody is worth salvaging. All right? And you can see the, I mean, people say, you know, well, Paul was right. You know, you can't take, you know, somebody like that. that and and I, I, just, I just really felt like, and, and folks, Paul wasn't per- perfect. Peter wasn't perfect. None of us are perfect. But I, I feel with all my heart, it's worth investing in somebody, even if they had failed. We need to come with them, and we need to give them a second chance. I know in my own life, even in ministry, even before ministry, God gave me three chances. Three chances. What if he'd have said after the second one, I've given you two chances. All I had to do is give you one, so I'm done with you. But he kept calling. Why? Because he, I mean, God wanted to invest in my life. And so in in it's saying there, look at verse 39. And the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. I'm talking two spiritually mature Christians said, if you're taking him, I'm not going. I'm not going. You know, I'll find somebody else to go with. And then it said, so Barnabas took a mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed and being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through uh, Syria and Sicilia, uh, strengthening the churches. Now here's the kicker about it. Instead of one missionary journey, what just took place? See, Satan wanted to destroy relationship. Folks, I am telling you, Satan wants to destroy relationships. God wants to restore relationships. And he, he got the t- when the Bible says it was so contentious, basically it's telling me that they weren't even speaking to one another. They just, they both sat down and just said, he's not gone. He needs to go. And so they just parted ways. And folks, here's what I believe with all my heart. If we could just somehow sit down and talk to people without being mad, without raising our voices, without accusations, there is nothing that we cannot work out in a church. But do you know what Satan wants to do? He wants to divide and conquer the church. He really does. And so these two spiritually mature men took sides and just says, we're not going But you know what resulted? Here's where God entered. He said, those two guys are acting like knuckleheads right now. And I'm putting, I'm paraphrasing here. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make two mission teams out of this. Okay? Brother Mike, are you saying, hey, God calls them to fight so that would happen? No. I think that was a personal choice. Okay? One or both chose not to give in. And folks, (laughs) I'm just telling my dad used to say to me, you're one of the most stubborn persons I've ever met in my life. And I would tell him, well, I came from you, Dad. And there's nothing wrong with being stubborn for being, you know, but, but the deal is there's a difference from being stubborn and being right. Okay, N- let me say this. Nobody's right every time. Nobody. Okay, Jesus is the only one right. And that's why I'm saying these contentions should not, they should have been able to sit down and work something out. And even in peace and in love, they could have divided the teams and one of them could have said, hey, I got an idea. I think that could have happened, okay? But uh, it did not happen. But God got the glory because two mission teams were formed out of this. And you know the second part of that? They did cover more ground. I mean, if you're going north and I'm going south, we're covering a, a larger area. And folks, God, God does think God amends even sometimes when we don't do the right thing. All right, folks, I'm just telling you, uh, forgiveness. We all need to be quick to forgive. If somebody asks for our forgiveness, we need to forgive. I mean. The disciples were sitting around thinking uh, one day, hey, Jesus, how many times we have to 
forgive somebody. You know, and again, Peter was probably the spokesperson. Somebody probably put him up to it. And he threw out a deal. Well, how about 70 times 7? And what did the accountant say? All right, 490 times. I'm going to start me a journal. <laughs> Every time somebody, I'm going to start marking them down. That's not what he meant, folks. He meant if someone sincerely asks for your forgiveness, you need to forgive them. Okay, and man, and I'm not, folks, we don't have a problem. I'm not coming from a problem in the church. I'm coming from, we are all ministers. We all have ministry, and Satan will do anything to keep us from ministry. But here's what I found out about ministering to someone. When you are pouring your life into someone, all right, you are not as concerned about what's going on in your own life. When you invest time in someone. And do you realize sometimes that's all a person needs? They just need one person to pay attention to them. They just need one person to say, hey, it's okay. You're not always going to do the right thing. And that's why mentoring is so important. We need to be ministers and, and mentors uh, for people uh, that are new Christians or people uh, that are not committed Christians or people that have not grown we don't need to judge them. Matthew 7 clearly says, judge not lest you be judged. So we see two kinds of Christians. We see two kinds of ministers. And look, let's look at two kinds of rewards. Verse 11, for no, one, no, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What's Paul saying? Man, if you'll put the Word of God... If you'll put a relationship to Jesus Christ, if you'll invest in this person and, and just come along beside them, okay? Uh, and, and it can be anything. Y'all can, y'all can be doing the same, you know, Bible study. You know, you get a certain one. I mean, I, I do ours here, the daily breads. I do that in the morning. And then I do a different one at night. And so you could come along beside somebody and call them and just say, Hey, what did you get out of this Bible? You don't have to call them every day. But if you're going to mentor, you need to talk to them at least once a week. Okay? And that's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, the main thing is to keep Jesus the main thing. All right? Because you can say what you want, folks. Everything that we do at Rye Hill Baptist Church, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's not about us. And I'm telling you, I do not like when I hear this. This is my classroom. This is my, and, and I, I have told you many, many times, folks, it's ours and it's God's. Okay, it's God's ministry. Every ministry that we have here, the food bank ministry, folks, it's God's ministry. Randy, didn't you tell me just a few minutes ago, we've already given out 70 sacks of groceries and it's Wednesday. Now, you don't think that we're making a, a difference in this town? I promise you. We got a card today in the mail of food bank lady just sent us a Christmas card and simply said, I, I read it this afternoon. It said, you, don't, you just don't know how much this means to us. We're going to have a better Christmas because y'all gave us a sack of food. And folks, even it's the little things. And when we invest in people, I'll tell you what God does. He multiplies it. He just multiplies it. And sometimes... I know, Randy, we talked several years ago about, you know, what if we run out of money? Can I ask you a question? Have we? We've never run out of money for food, okay? And folks, I, I do want to, you know, just encourage you. I mean, all we have to do here is to say this is a ministry need and God will provide. We have a giving, loving church. And folks, that's the way a New Testament church is supposed to work. Okay? And then it says, lay the foundation of Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. Folks, the rewards is something that, I mean, you can talk about it, you know, and, you know, but we are getting rewards. The Bible tells us. In heaven, there are rewards. 
And it's not going to be one of these, you know, we're all standing around, well, how many you got, Mike? Well, hey, Steve, how many you got? Hey, how many you got, Tony? How many awards you got? That's not what it's about, folks. All right? It's laying those rewards at the foot of Jesus because, folks, if it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't be in heaven anyway. So we need to give God the credit. We need, we, we get, re- but, and, and again, it, it's not bait. It's, it's not, this is the reason we do things. It's just simply God saying, good job. You ran the race. You finished the course. You kept the faith. And that's what he has said here. And then it says, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. <coughs> Excuse me. When it comes to works, folks, motives come right along beside those. Why do we do what we do? Folks, I'm just telling you, we do it for God. We do it for Jesus. We do it for the ministry's sake. We do it for for seeing the church grow. And I'm telling you, I never, when I left, when I left the First Baptist Church and came over here, I never even thought about a building program. Not, that was so far from my, I just never thought we would have what we have now. But God has rewarded us. And I'm telling you, we need to keep mentoring people and helping people. Verse 14, if anyone's work, (coughs) excuse me, uh, with which he built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt, is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Hold on a sec. (coughs) This is the first time I just realized that I've preached twice in one day. So, just my throat's really tickly right now. Revelation twenty two twelve. <coughs> Revelation twenty two twelve. Revelation twenty two twelve says, "And behold, I come quickly." This is Jesus's words. It's in red. My reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. And folks, we don't, we don't work for rewards. All right? it's, it's not like being paid for what you do. When we have a job, we make a certain amount of money, and that's, that's, you know, that's our agreement. But he's simply saying, you will be rewarded uh, for, for the work that you do. And, and again, I truly believe we're going to lay those at Jesus' feet. Now, 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, (coughs) I apologize, verse 6, so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I like to say this. Uh, Steve pointed it out a few years ago when he said, do you realize that you say that every funeral? Every funeral I'll say, when you take your last breath on earth, you're going to take your first breath in heaven. You ever thought about what that breath is going to be like? I have pure, clean air. The, the just the atmosphere of heaven, just knowing there is no temptation, there are no problems, there's no arguments in heaven, there's no sin in heaven. I'm just telling you folks, I truly believe in our mind we cannot fathom what heaven is going to be like. Verse 9, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Hey, let me give you a hint. <laughs> and I know you know this. You, you just need to be reminded every, every once in a while. 
you're not going to please everybody around you. It's impossible. I think Chuck told me back in the fall that we went over 700 members. Do you think for one minute I can make 700 people happy? <laughs> but you know what? I don't have to. And I want everybody to be happy. I want everybody to want to come to church. But there's so many opinions out there, folks. So many opinions. And here's the key right here. Whether present or absent, to be pleasing to him. You know what my goal in life is? It's not to please people around me. It's to please my Heavenly Father. With my life. With my walk. With helping others. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive what things has been done in the body according to what he has done, whether it is good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust we are well known in your consciences. What did he throw verse 11 in for? Because there are still people out there that needs a salvation experience. Folks, I'm telling you, there are still people out there that need to be saved. And do you realize Every time somebody gets saved, we're getting closer to the rapture. I'm serious. That's exactly what the Bible is saying. God already knows that number. And I have no idea what that number is. I got a good feeling it's getting lower. And when that last person is saved, all eternity is starting. Folks, that should scare us. That ought to encourage us. Man, we're going to go see Jesus. We're not going to have to buy $4 gas or $5 milk. I mean, and you just think about our world. It, you know, it, sometimes it's just messed up, folks. Heaven is a perfect place. And I think you're like me, and I close with this. I believe every one of us, of us want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, thank you for Scripture. Thank you for Paul. He was a mentor. God, I know Timothy and just others he mentored. And God, I just pray that even we as strong Christians will come along beside somebody and will just help them and just walk with them on their spiritual journey. And God, I pray that we will continue to be looking for people to encourage. And I thank you that uh, I could read a card like today that very friendly church. And God, I pray we will continue to do that. But God, I pray that our motives would always be right. God, I pray that we could just have peace and unity and contentment. I know Satan doesn't want that in our church, but God, help us to guard that. It's your church. We're protecting your church. God, I just pray, Lord, that as we look, and I pray that we see everybody is a prospect. Everybody is somebody that we can invite. Everybody that we can tell them what the Lord has done in our life. God, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. And God, just thank you that even with Paul and Barnabas, they didn't get along in one situation. But God, I pray, as your word says, that we will be peacemakers. That we will love people and we'll give them hope. And we'll show them the love of Jesus. No matter what, God, I pray we will always want to be more like Jesus. In his name we pray.